Всем добрый день. Джейн и я очень рад быть с вами сегодня. We will be speaking to you today about globalization through the ecological lens. But first, our thanks to Professor Ilya Ilin, Dean of the Faculty of Global Studies at Moscow State University, the organizing committee of the Congress, and to our good friend, Professor Alexander Chumakov. We want to address the obvious implications of a global pandemic for globalization studies in general, as the virus mirrors realities of a far greater crisis afflicting our species in the biosphere, that sum total of destructions we all know to be the Anthropocene. COVID-19 has been preceded by at least 70 documented major infectious disease outbreaks, nearly all of which have been transmitted from other species from bubonic plague to mad cow disease. In addition, there have been 250 famines, killing over 300 million people during the past several thousand years that we know about. Each of these global events challenge our biological ability to somehow transcend the feedback loops that evolution has all but guaranteed as hard as we try to outsmart our own biological selves and all other species. But the reality reflects our species behavior. Humans kill between two to three trillion other animals every year. According to the World Wildlife Fund's most recent Living Planet Index, our kind has managed to ravage populations covering some 60% of all wildlife on Earth in the last 40 years alone. Within species-specific arenas, we kill between 20 and 25 billion chickens every year. Such slaughter is indicative, not merely a species-wide indifference, but of an ability at the local as well as global levels to grasp what we are doing. Such deliberate harm does not bode well for any kind of ethical jurisprudence or self-monitoring. Combined with zealous capitalism that embraces fanatical com competition and knows no boundaries, the outlook for humanity's ability to work together to dissuade, if not altogether eliminate violence on the planet, is more remote by the day. Add to this, the continuing human population explosion as we veer toward 9.5, indeed 10, possibly 11 billion people, depending upon which predictive demographic model one cares to believe in, along with the violent consumerism and toxic emissions our footprints inflict. And it becomes immediately clear that our species' very extinction is now a discussion on the table. And if one takes biodiversity and the continuing ecodynamic homeostasis of evolution, both at species and population levels, as the ultimate measure upon which human behavior should be modeled, and assuming we are rational enough to envision a globally sustainable distribution of Homo sapiens in coming years and decades, then it's quite clear to me that we need an urgent blueprint of informed regional and global partnerships that take heed of science and learn from our history, a conservation ethic that aspires appropriately to safeguard the in situ biodiversity covering at least 50% of the planet, a teamwork effort in this instance means individuals working together collectively, public-private partnerships, and thousands of collectivities working together globally. Such collaborations are not merely about money or scientific and medical breakthroughs, although certainly those must enter into any realistic equations. But teamwork efforts are about humility and a certain distinctly human altruism that comes in the wake of shared suffering. 
and a shared resolve to ameliorate such pain in ourselves and in others, not least of which all those chickens Jane just referred to. Now, the problem with technofixes is borne out by the legacy, for example, of the Green Revolution, which only postponed by about four decades the looming inevitability of monoculture, ruined soils, and a rural to urban migration in country after country, leaving the promise of nutrition and food security for economically regionalized economically regionalized areas of the planet uh, as bad as it was before Norman uh, Borlaug and his colleagues got the Nobel Prize for their efforts. Today, with 800 million people malnourished and a huge population throughout the world that qualifies as obese, we have dilemmas to cope with that our ancestors could never have imagined. On the famine front, we continue to see arguments which hail the ability of smart farming, vertical agriculture, et cetera, to produce enough food for everyone versus those who point to the inequitable and inefficient mechanisms of egalitarian distribution and blockchain vulnerabilities in the agricultural sector to disease, terrorism, and other escalating catastrophes engendered by climate change. And while neurophysics points to the human encephalization quotient, Homo sapiens, the mass of our cerebellums and huge number of packed neurons therein, we are still very much in the dark with respect to what it takes to teach empathy, to ensure fair and equitable trade and immigration policies, and to understand what our humble role actually is as a species within a biosphere where there may be as many as 100 million other species sharing this planet with us. Indeed, Measuring all those species according to the amount of carbon they incorporate, which is a very interesting and basic indicator of life on Earth, shows that the human species represents a mere 0 0.06 gigatons of incorporated carbon, whereas the rest of life in total amounts to roughly 550 gigatons or 121 trillion pounds of life on Earth. That's what's at stake here. In other words, do we have an inherent metaphysical protection that evolution has primed to work in favor of biological interdependency? We know from countless individuals that such a gene or set of genes or predilections do exist. We see it in the example of Albert Schweitzer, of Gandhi, or Buddha, of Christ, and Andrei Rublev, of Mozart, and Leonardo. But do we see it collectively? And if not, how do we somehow tame the collective or mentor it by the example of more and more individuals, fired up youths, the wisdom of elders, and the hundreds of millions of remaining indigenous peoples who have never swayed from sustainable livelihoods, but now find themselves trapped by modernity and by 7 billion others who soon will inhabit as many as 40 megacities, each exceeding 30 million individuals, the global portrait of a world in which as much as 80% of the human population cohabits such megacities, offers striking and imaginative possibilities for rescuing threatened and endangered habitats and the species and populations therein. Two of the most promising conservation methodologies include the hotspots and cold spots approaches. The former refers to less than 3% of the terrestrial planet containing 36 hotspots, those regions in which at least 70% of the vascular flowering plant species are endemic and are at risk. Flowering plants are essentially indicators of other species abundance and high levels of local endemism, beginning with the pollinators and other insects and spiders. Cold spots refer to those areas as yet under the radar 
of the 70,000 or so species that have been most intensively studied for their vulnerabilities by the IC, IUCN under the aegis of the IUCN Red List. Recognizing that there may well be 100 million species on the planet, with fewer than 1.5 million having been formally identified, our methodological extrapolations suggest that we are still scientific newborns when it comes to even partially recognizing the exquisite abundance of biodiversity, let alone genetic diversity, on this planet. Well, in the United Nations list of protected areas, uh, it's called the, the Protected Planet Report of 2018, uh, Analysis of comparable effective strategies of management according to numerous IUCN criteria uh, of those protected areas makes clear that there is great progress being made. There's been a doubling in five years of marine protected areas to over 3% globally. It remains a far cry from the aspired Convention on Biological Diversity, IHE 11 target of 10% coastal and marine protections by this year. But terrestrially, there's been an increase to over 15% globally, which is close to the 17% target. Uh, now, of great interest, uh, since 2008, the number of protected areas worldwide has increased from over 206,000 to over 238,500 protected areas in around 244 countries and territories. And this, this is, covers about 46 million square kilometers of the planet. That seems like a lot, and it is, but the problem is there's a huge amount of work yet to be done if we're ever going to achieve the new methodology of choice, which is characterized as a half-Earth strategy. That is, 50% of the planet would be protected. Now, with over 3,715 ecological agreements between countries and within countries, and a rising human population, the central questions of our time, and time is running out, is really the following. Do we have what it takes as individuals and as a species to find more lasting treaty compliance measures and inspired protective mechanisms for the biosphere do we have what it takes to become greenhouse gases neutral or negative, to deaccelerate the population explosion, and to embrace diets and consumption that do not involve killing? These are really key global challenges. And if we, if we fail to address them in, ge in this generation, we're in big trouble. We're already in big trouble. The vulnerabilities of climate change and this tragedy of COVID-19 have brought to the fore ironically, as tragic as both emergencies are, the fact that this generation is challenged like never before. Uh, let us hope that we can find the inner strength, the resolve, the compassion to take up these challenges and embrace like never before the appropriate measures needed to not just save the biosphere, but of course, to save ourselves. On that note, we want to thank all of you for having us and to wish you a warm dasvidanya and to Please be sure, take stay care, safe. stay safe, stay well. And uh, we wish this Congress and this conference and all the conferees the very best. And thanks for having us. Take care.